2022, a year of surprises and a year that most of us prayed, hoped, and anticipated better things after the pandemic. 2022 also gave us an opportunity to think about the things that that are happening in end times prophecies and, and how things are playing out in the world around us. Hi, and welcome to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund. And in today's special episode, we're going to examine some of the episodes in the year of 2022 that stood out for you, our listeners, some of the thoughts and comments that you've made, as well as the things that, that we've said so that you can be better informed about what's happening in the epicenter. Are you ready? Great. Okay, let's get going. One of the episodes that gathered many listens and views in 2022 is episode 39. It aired in February and it was titled, Will Russia Draw the U.S. and NATO into War over Ukraine? This episode aired when tensions were high in Europe, troops were massed on the borders, and rumors of war lingered. Here's some of the highlights. I think it's a chilling situation um, where Russia seems to be heading. This is, uh, let's just say this right up front. We won't save this for just the end. Like we need Christians all over the world to be praying uh, for peace, yeah. um, not just of Jerusalem, but do that too. But peace in Europe, um, that, uh, that the Lord would would uh, uh, d- d- diffuse this, yeah. uh, this crisis that's building uh, between Russia and Ukraine, and um, and it, it because if this thing blows, uh, we'll have the largest war in Europe since World War II. Yeah. There are close to 150,000 Russian troops um, uh, massed along both the Russian-Ukrainian border, but also inside Belarus, which is a separate mm-hmm. and theoretically sovereign country, but a close ally of, uh, uh, of Russia, Russia, Putin. And uh, and that's actually where my my family is from, from hmm. Belarus. Uh, hmm. from, it, it is considered Russia historically, uh, but it's a, its own independent country at, at the moment. Minsk is its capital, yeah. and Russian troops are have been invited in by the Belarusian president to engage in war games. So yeah. uh, it's a serious crisis. And, I, and and a new report that just came out last week says if this thing goes full on, there could be fifty thousand deaths in yeah. the theater and hundreds of thousands of uh, war refugees fleeing in every direction. Yeah. I mean, I think for many of our listeners, they may be familiar with this, but let's set the stage a little bit. How did we get to this place with, you know, tens of thousands, over a hundred thousand troops, perhaps uh, from Russia and Belarus, right on the border of Ukraine. And what does it really mean for, for the state of things in Europe right now? Well, if you ask a Russian, you're going to get a very different answer than asking a Ukrainian. Um, and there are Russian uh, ethnic Russians living in Ukraine because it was all one big unhappy family once, <laughs> uh, the Soviet Union, right? And at the collapse of the Soviet Union in, you know, on Christmas Day, uh, 1991, I believe it was, uh, that was the end of the Soviet Union for good. And uh, that's extraordinary. And um, Ukraine became its own independent country. Now, the Russian people and every Russian president, every Russian leader, has always seen Ukraine as part of Mother Russia. It's not a separate country in their mind. It's theirs. And uh, there are deep uh, historical connections and roots. But of course, there was you know 70 some years of Soviet occupation of all the neighboring uh, countries. Um, Why is that important? It's important because from the Russian mindset, from the mindset of the Kremlin, they don't see this as a a, a foreign country that they're going to go invade. They, Putin, Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, sees this as uh, reincorporating back into Mother Russia what is is his, what is theirs. Um, That's a problem, Uh, you know, because, um, and, and there's an interesting geopolitical moment that happened when the Soviet Union collapsed. Okay? Mm-hmm. You'll recall that uh, Bill Clinton was the president of the United States um, 
in the in in the years at least, you know, it was it was George W. George H. W. Bush that was president when the Soviet Union fell, but when Clinton won in 1992 and became president in January of 1993, this was the time where things were sort of calming down, and now the question is, how do we sort of figure out the post-Cold War era, the post-Soviet right. era? Now, what happened is the, the Ukrainian government had on its territory nuclear weapons atop of high-speed, long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles. They were Soviet, right? And the Soviets considered, or the Russians considered after the Soviet Union collapsed, they're ours. And the Ukrainians said, well, too bad. <laughs> we have We them. don't ever want... We're not going to. We're not. We're not going to point them at the Americans and the, and and NATO, because we're friends with them. Mm -hmm. But we have been invaded and occupied so many times by you mm -hmm. in Russia that we're going to keep the nuclear weapons, and uh, and that'll be our safeguard that you will never occupy us again. Now, what happened is that the Clinton administration brokered a deal. Mm -hmm. in which the Secretary of State and Vice President Gore and, you know, and, and Clinton himself all negotiated this deal where, listen, 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 you, you can't keep nuclear weapons. That's, that's just not going to be tenable for the rest of the world. We will be your ally. And, right. and, and as long as we are around, you don't have to worry. But please, trust us. Give back the weapons because they're going to come for them. Like, like it's just a problem. And the Ukrainians got a memo, but they never got a treaty. Yeah. They were not allowed to join NATO. And so the Ukrainians took the deal. Mm -hmm. And now they are thinking, holy smokes, this right. is what we feared, that someday some Russian leader would threaten to take us over all over again, and we would have nobody to help us. We're not in NATO, so that means what's called Article 5, which is the, 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 the bedrock foundational principle of NATO, it doesn't kick in. What is Article yeah. 5? It's if one country in, in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is attacked, everybody yeah. will come to its defense, right? They're, Ukraine is not part of NATO. Right. And, and now the Biden administration is, is, is uh, showing very little interest in helping to the extent that the Ukrainians feel they need help. Yeah. Um, and the, the neighboring NATO countries are basically trying to do a little bit to bolster their own defenses, lest Putin go crazy and attack everybody as well. But that's that's the situation that we're in. And again, I'm not trying to make a partisan point. I'm just trying right. to say, why does Putin feel tempted that this is the moment to go get the prize for which every Russian longs? One crucial point to note here is that as Christians— we must always pray for the peace of the places we live in, in Jerusalem, in distant places that we cannot see as well. Thank God for the prayers of the saints in dealing with the situations that they're facing. More than always, this region, Europe today, needs our prayers. Can you guess what the next episode on our list of top episodes of 2022 is? It's this. Is the war of Gog and Magog coming? Understanding Ezekiel 38 and 39 and the end of days. Episode 40 was another episode that stood out in 2022. In this episode, Joel provides helpful insights into the prophecy around Gog and Magog found in the book of Ezekiel. And he considers the possibility that we are witnessing Old Testament prophecies being fulfilled. Additionally, he outlines who the modern day players are, their roles and their place in this prophecy. Listen to Joel point out a few things in this episode. Russia technically right now isn't not an ally, but a friend, a good acquaintance, let's say, with <laughs> Israel, right? Right now, Russia is not threatening to attack Israel. So you say, well, Joel, you, you just, you're just blowing smoke. Well, I don't think I'm doing that. And in fact, what we're watching is, and then look at other countries. One of the countries is Gomer. That's not where Gomer Pyle is from. That's <laughs> Turkey. 
Now, as I describe in previous shows and I describe in the book uh, Enemies and Allies, Turkey had been a, it, it, Turkey is a NATO ally. It is an American ally. But under the, its current president, Recep Erdogan, it's shifting from a Western uh, identity and alliance towards the dark side, towards Russia, towards Iran. Look, we can't go through all of them, but but uh, another one, I'll just say one other one is put. Okay, in the Bible it says mm -hmm. uh, put is in the list. And I say to people, where do you put put? Put. <laughs> well, again, if you asked Josephus 2,000 years ago in his Antiquities of the Jews, one of the probably the greatest history of the Jewish people, he says that put is what the Greeks call ancient Libyos. Mm -hmm. Today we call it Libya. Okay, now... Mm -hmm. Ancient Libya was a larger territory than current Libya, so this could include Algeria, maybe mm -hmm. Tunisia, we don't know. But certainly Libya right now, yeah. ally of Russia, ally of Iran, uh, you know, a basket case of a country, tragically, yeah. and hates Israel. So I say all that because there are others, but I think just the, the point is, in the future, someday, the Bible says that Russia is going to form an alliance with several countries. The main one is Iran, and then there'll mm -hmm. be a group of other countries. Now, countries like Egypt, not mentioned in yeah. the alliance. Now you say, well, God, did God just forget about Egypt? No. You know, don't you remember, Joel, the history of, uh, of Yule Brunner and uh, Charlton Heston, you know, and the whole you know, <laughs> history of Egypt hating Israel? Yes, I remember that history. But in 1979... Egypt made peace with Israel, and as mm -hmm. I report in Enemies and Allies, the current president of Egypt, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, I've met with him four times and seen him a fifth time, and he loves Israel. Mm -hmm. And he loves Netanyahu when Netanyahu was prime minister. Very close relationship between Egypt and Israel. Interesting. One more. The nation of Babylon is not mentioned in the Bible. The word Iraq is never mentioned in the Bible, but even the historical names for the country we know is Iraq, Babel, Babylon, Babylonia, mm -hmm. Shinar, Mesopotamia, all those ancient names, none of them are used in this list of allied countries. And you ask, Interesting. did God forget about one of the worst enemies of Israel ever, up to mm -hmm. and including Saddam Hussein? No, he didn't forget. Somehow, Carl, and I'll wrap up with this point, and then you take us wherever you want to start landing yeah. the plane. But, yeah. But because we haven't gone to where what happens in the prophecy, but but the key is the setup to me. Sure. Because God wins and he saves Israel. So, spoiler alert. Oh, but, man, but now the, I don't go the see key, the movie. Yeah. The key is what God is saying. So, so, so take an Etch-a-Sketch and shake it of all we've just said. Mm. Let's just put a few things back on the Etch-a-Sketch, okay, to keep it simple. There's going to be an evil dictator in the country we know today as Russia. That's number one. Number two, he's going to form alliance with a group of countries because he has an evil plan. Three, Iran is going to be the chief among equals, but there will be other countries too. This will be a military attack against Israel. Mm -hmm. It will happen in the last days of history, meaning mm -hmm. the lead up. That's the terms that the Lord uses in prophecy to say the lead up mm -hmm. to the second coming of Christ. And... It, this all happens at a time in history when Israel has been rebuilt as a country, as a sovereign mm -hmm. nation state. Israel has Jews pouring back in from all over the world. These Jewish people are rebuilding the ancient ruins. They've built a, a strong army. They feel secure. Yeah. But this alliance is coming, and the alliance doesn't include the two most important historic enemies of Israel, Egypt and yeah. Iraq. Yeah. Now, we are living in the first window in all of the 2,600 years since the prophecy was written in which all the pieces that God said would fall into place in the last days for this apocalyptic attack against Israel, they're falling into place they seem to be right now. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean the prophecy will happen in the next few weeks or months or years. Maybe 
God kicks the prophetic can up the road 50 years, 100 years. He can do it if he wants. But we've never, yeah. ever seen the convergence of all the major pieces of this prophecy ever come into this alignment until right now. And that's why we should be watching yeah. this thing really closely. I appreciate this so much because as we read the scripture, we see that God sees Israel as the center of his plans and purposes. And understanding this helps us find the meaning of what the prophecy of Gog and Magog and the players that are on the chessboard today, like Russia, Iran, Sudan, and Turkey are all about. We're going to take a quick break right now. And after we do, I want to ask you, what do you think was the most listened to episode in all of 2022? We'll be right back. Our verse of the day today is found in Matthew chapter 19, verse 2. But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And our prayer request today is, our number one, pray that as this year ends, that saints around the world will be encouraged, no matter what circumstances they're facing, to hold on to their faith in the Lord. Second, pray that the Lord blesses the Joshua Fund. All the plans that have been made, all of the work that has been done this year to make a more significant impact on the people and places we serve in the epicenter. Hi, welcome back. Let's see what the next top episode for 2022 is all about. Episode 41 was titled, Amidst Putin's Threats, Is God Shaking Europe to Draw People to Himself? It was an episode that featured Joel's keynote address in Tallinn, Estonia at the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast. It was given less than two weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine. And Joel was able to speak about the unfortunate similarities between current events and one of his best-selling novels. He also shares his heart for the Estonian people to come to know their Messiah and encourage them by outlining the power and faithfulness of God. This episode was very popular with you, our listeners, as Joel's address was broadcast to the entire nation of Estonia. Here are some highlights. I may be the only person to ever have written uh, a novel in the United States about Estonia. Me pole mulle ainus inimene, kes Ameerika Andrikides on kirjutanud novelli Eestist. And I've always wanted to come visit. Ja ma olen alati tahtnud tulla ja külastada Eestit. But I never imagined to, Aga ma poleks iial arvanud, that I would be invited to come et mind kutsutakse sellisel ajal in the midst of such a crisis as this. Et just selline kriis ongi meid tabanud. And to come for a gathering of Christians to pray. Ja, et me oleme just tulnud ajal, kus kristlased on kokku saanud, et palvetada. In the darkest hour. Kõige pimedamal tunnil. When we need to know whether God is listening or not. Kui me peame tõesti teadma, kas Jumal meid kuuleb või mitte. One of the saddest things I've learned about Estonia. Üks kõige kurvemaid asju, mis ma Eesti kohta olen õppinud, is not only that you were occupied by Nazi Germany, et mitte ainult siis, kui Nazi Saksamaa teid okupeeris, and that you were occupied for so long by the cruel, evil empire of the Soviet Union. Ja et pärast nõukogude hirmus kuri okupatsioon sellele järgnes kauaks ajaks. A member of parliament told me yesterday that for the last thousand years you've been in attacked and invaded by Russia time and time and time again. Üks parlamendi liige ütles mulle, et tuhande aasta vältel on Venema kordi ja jälle ja uuesti Eesti maad rünnand ja vallutanud. But to me, as horrible as that is, it's not the saddest thing that I've learned. Aga nii hirmus kui see ka poleks, see ei olnud kõige kurvem asi, mis ma teada sain. The saddest thing that I've learned about Estonia is that so few people here believe in God. Kõige kurvem oli see, et nii vähe inimesi Eestimaal Jumalasse usub. 
that this is the least religious country on the planet. Etse on üks kõige vähem religioosne rahvas maa peal. There is widespread spirituality. On väga palju kõiksugu müstilisi vaimu vaimu vaimulike misiganes paganlike liikumisi. More and more magic. Nõidust. More and more new age. Enam ja rohkem new age. A wide range of ways of trying to find God. Imelike viise, kuidas inimesed arvavad end Jumalat leidvad. But in a nation of such few people who believe in one true God to begin with, Aga et selles rahva seas, kus on isegi vähe inimesi, kes usuvad ainsasse tõelisesse Jumalasse, fewer still believe that the Bible reveals who God is. Usub sellesse, et Piibel ilmutab meile seda, kes Jumal on. And fewer still have come to know the good news that Jesus is our Messiah, the King, the, the Lord who came to save us and redeem us. Ja veel vähem on neid, kes on uskunud, et Jeesus on see, kes on tõeline messi ja, ja on tulnud meid päästma ja lunastama. That the painting on the wall behind me tells the greatest story in all of mankind. Et see maal minu selja taga räägib inimkonna kõige suuremat, kõige võimsemat lugu. So, with the darkest of night falling again ja kõige pimedama öö langedes selle riigi üle we pray for the lord to thwart the evil ambitions of the kremlin me palvetame ühes koos et jumal võiks need kremli kurjad kavatsused ringi pöörata to rescue ukraine pasta ukraina to rescue the baltics aga ka pasta balti riigid to save Estonia. Et pasta Eestima. And we believe that God not only hears our prayers but can may he he can answer those. He can say no to Putin. Ja me tõesti siin ühes koos usume, et Jumal mitte üksi ei saa keelata Putinit vaid saab ta plaanid tühjaks teha. A, a president of France may not say no to him. Võibolla Prantsuse president ei ütleks Putinile ei. A German chancellor might not say no to Võib, Putin. Võibolla Saksa kantsler ei ütleks uh, ei Putinile. An American president might say no, but might not convince Putin not to act. Let's be honest. Ja oleme ausad ka Ameerika president võibolla ütleks ei, aga ei suudaks küll veenda teda selles, et ta midagi rohkemat ette võtaks. But our God is a sovereign God. Aga meie Jumal on suvereenne. He is an almighty God. Kõik võimas Jumal. He can stop evil if he chooses. Tema võib selle kurja peatada, kui ta nii otsustab. Obviously this is our prayer. Loomulikult kuuleb ta meie palveid. My friend Rabbi Yehuda Glick made the case that God has saved Israel many, many times. Minu sõber, Rabbi Juda Klik, just rääkis, kuidas Jumal on Iisraeli nii palju kordi päästnud. And Yehuda shared how God let an evil man shoot him four times in the chest. Ja ta rääkis ka, kuidas Jumal lubas sellel juhtuda, et see terrorist teda neljal korral, neli korda tulistas. But God heard the prayers of people all over the world asking the Lord to save the life of Yehuda Glick. Aga et Jumal kuulis kõigi nende inimeste palvet üle maailma, et päästa juuda elu. So even when the Lord allows evil to happen, he can show his mercy and his power. Wow. You know, when I listen to that, I'm reminded that God is faithful despite all that we face. We need to trust in him and his faithfulness no matter what, no matter how discouraging and dark things may be. Even when the Lord allows evil to happen, it can show his mercy, grace, and power, and also his faithfulness. Have you guessed correctly about our top episode yet? Okay, well, let's look at the next top episode for 2022. Episode 45, a few months back, Pastor Greg Laurie spoke about the rapture of the church, the signs of the times, and Bible prophecy. In this episode, Greg Laurie examines Bible prophecy, 
the Antichrist, the rapture of the church, living a life fully committed to Jesus, and many other things. It was one of our most enjoyed and listened to episodes for many of you throughout the whole year. Let's listen to a clip from Pastor Lori. As believers, we pay attention as we look at the epicenter uh, there in Israel, and specifically Jerusalem, and obviously any threats against the existence of the state of Israel, any talk about conflict breaking out in Jerusalem is of great interest to the student of prophecy. And if you're fascinated by this, you're always looking for things. Now, I have to say, I, I know a few people that maybe try to find a fulfillment of Bible prophecy in just about anything. You know, they're scouring the one ads or signs of the times that you can maybe get a little bit too carried away. Here's one thing to remember. We're told we can know when the times and seasons are, but no man knows the day or the hour. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, of that day and hour knows no man, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. If you were to translate that from the original language, it would pretty much say the exact same thing, okay? So this is what Jesus is saying. Don't try to pick out a date and people have done that. No one knows the day of the hour. Sometimes the chronology becomes more important to us than the theology, and we end up with mythology, and we can get sidetracked and distracted. So let's keep our eye on the ball, on the big picture. Christ is coming. Okay, now I want to talk about what that means, because we've heard a lot about how soon it could be. We've heard quite a bit about uh, things that are happening that remind us that it's soon, but what is the next event on the prophetic calendar? No one can say with complete certainty. It could be the attack of Magog, read Russia, on Israel. Uh, I certainly don't expect the Antichrist to emerge. It's my belief that the Antichrist cannot emerge on the scene until the church is caught up to meet the Lord in heaven. Therefore, I'm not looking for Antichrist. I'm looking for Jesus Christ. So I think it's a bit of a waste of our time to try to figure out who the Antichrist is. But I believe the next event, most likely on the prophetic calendar, will be the rapture of the church. Now, some people protest this, and they say, well, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. Well, I won't disagree with you. It depends on what kind of translation you read. If you read a Latin translation, you would find the word rapturus in there. But certainly the event is spoken of many times. Paul addressed it in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, a very familiar verse. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we which are alive and remaining shall be caught up. That's that word. A rapturist taken by force, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and will always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Is this spoken of elsewhere? Yes, it is. John 14, Jesus said in my Father's house are many mansions, and where we're not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. And that phrase could be translated, I'll take you by force. Again, referring to it, Christ says in Matthew 24, 40, two men will be in a field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at a handmill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. This shows that it's a global event. Some are working in a field. It's afternoon. Others are in bed. It's nighttime. Instantaneously around the globe, all those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ are caught up to meet the Lord in the air. How long will it take? It'll happen so quickly you couldn't measure it in human time. It's in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That comes from the word atomos, and it's one thousandth of a second. <laughs> That's how fast. Uh, one night my wife and I were laying in bed. It's okay, we're married. And um, <laughs> we were talking about the Lord's return, and, and my wife said, Greg, just imagine we could be laying here in bed and wake up the next morning in heaven. Greg, wouldn't that be great? Just imagine, as she's saying it, being the practical joker I can be at times, I quietly slipped out of the bed and I was <laughs> laying on the floor. She said, Greg, just imagine we'll be, Greg, Greg, Greg! <laughs> laying on the ground laughing. Don't do that. <laughs> I am a professional. <laughs> Idiot. So yes, Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians 15, 
we will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Now, there are approximately 7 billion people on the face of the earth today. How many of those are Christians? No one could say with certainty. I've read that there are some 2 billion Christians on the face of the earth. I find that very unlikely. So let's be very conservative and let's cut it in half and say there's 1 billion. Let's even be more conservative and say there's 500 million. No matter how you slice it or dice it, imagine the effect on planet Earth if 500 million and certainly 1 billion people suddenly disappear. You could see how economies would collapse literally overnight. You could see how things would be ripe for that coming world leader the Bible calls the beast and the Antichrist to emerge on the scene and so forth. You know, the rapture of the church and the coming of the Lord is imminent, and we should dwell on that, encourage each other with that. And it should engender in us the opportunity to live a godly life and invest our time here on earth wisely. The days are drawing short and the time is coming close. It's an opportunity for all of us who love Jesus to look forward to Jesus's coming return. The previous episode we talked about, is the war of Gog and Magog coming? Understanding Ezekiel 38 and 39 and the end of days was so well received and prompted us to to visit that topic again a second time to answer some of the questions raised and to explain further what the growing speculation regarding Putin and Russia at the center of Ezekiel's Old Testament prophecy were really all about. I know you'll enjoy this episode uh, as we go forward in the best of 2022. So short version, short version, uh, Gog is not a name of a person. He, it is a figure, it's a character in the prophecy, but it's not, a, it's not someone's last name. We're not looking for Bob Gog or Fred <laughs> Gog or Dimitri Gog. Gog is a title. And it's like a pharaoh or a czar in that sense that it's a, it, what we see in the text is he, he's, he's the ruler of a whole territory. He's the leader and ruler, um, maybe grand strategist of a coalition of countries that are mm. going to do something evil. Uh, the mm. text tells us that he has an evil thought, uh, an evil uh, scheme. And we know that he is a military leader. He's going to gather a group of uh, military forces from his own country and from other countries. Now, what country is that? Well, Gog, um, Gog is the leader of Magog. And you're like, well, that's not helping me any. No, I get that. But if you do the historical detective work, uh, we learn from ancient history, particularly the ancient historian Josephus, that the Magogites, the people of Magog, are the people whom the Greeks called Scythians. That's interesting because the Scythian uh, uh, there were more Greek historians that wrote about the Scythians than Jewish historians that wrote about the Magogites. Short version is the Scythians are the people who moved from the Middle East, migrated northward, and settled north of the Black Sea, north of the Caspian Sea, in the region we know today as Russia. God. Now, is it possible that Magog involves more territory than just modern-day Russia? Yeah, that's possible, but, but we can't be definitive about it. So we're looking for a dictator, an evil dictator, a military leader, and a coalition builder who's in charge of Russia at least. And he builds a coalition with other countries. Again, some of them are, are complicated names, but the main one, the first one that's mentioned is Persia. Well, that's right. an easy one to decipher because until 1935, Persia was the official legal name of the country today we call the Islamic Republic of Iran. So to sum that up, what, what do you have? You have 2,600 years ago, a Hebrew prophet looking down the corridors of history saying there's going to be a Russian-Iranian military alliance that's going to form and attack Israel in what the text says is the last days. That phrase is actually used in the prophecy. And, uh, and then very briefly, the, there are a number of other countries. They include... Uh, ancient name for the countries we today call Turkey, hmm. Sudan, uh, Libya, hmm. and a 
a number of Central Asian countries, possibly Turkmenistan, maybe some other Central Asian countries, uh, possibly Ethiopia, uh, and, and possibly Algeria. So uh, there is some wiggle room, though, things that we can't be sure and precise about, but some of the countries are, are absolutely definitive once you've studied wow. the history of these names. And the names, just to be clear, come from Genesis 10. These are not <laughs> names that are randomly generated. Sure. Ezekiel's referring to a group of tribes, descendants of Abraham, or descendants of, 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 of Adam and then eventually Noah, that right. spread out from the Middle East and go take up territory all over the world. And then the key is to trace the history of those tribes, where they were at the beginning, but where they have ended up over time. And that's the picture that we get of this Russian, Iranian, Turkish, etc. alliance. Interesting. This is so fascinating. And we talked last time about the difference, too, between the, the, the two wars of Gog and Magog, uh, right. one in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and one in Revelation 20. Just briefly, again, you know, what are the two distinctions between those two things and which one are we really kind of talking about today? Right. So the Revelation prophecy describes uh, a, a war of Gog and Magog and which involves every nation of the earth coming together against the nation of Israel. And this is at the end of the thousand year millennial reign of Christ on earth. Okay. okay. So those are the specific elements that tell you, okay, that seems different from Ezekiel 38 and 39. Why? Because Ezekiel 38 and 39 describes a limited coalition. Hmm. Fearsome, but limited. It gives us specific uh, tribes and therefore countries that we can say, okay, that's in the coalition. Ezekiel does not describe this as an entire global alliance. Got it. Um, and that's... Uh, and the other thing is that at the end of the Revelation version, literally when God wins and defeats all these forces, that's the literal end of the earth and the that's heavens it. as we know it. And then God right. destroys the heavens and the earth and creates a new heaven and earth. That's not what happens in Ezekiel. So if, if you I, just look at the concept Gog and Magog, you might think, well, that's the same war. But if you look yeah. at the details, you say, no, that's different. Why is it different? Because the war of Gog and Magog the one that I think is coming, whether it happens in our lifetime, that's a different question. But it could. It could. And it's going to be so dramatic, as we're going to talk about, so catastrophic, so definitive in world history that the next war like it, even though it's going to be worse the next time, it's going to be larger, they're going to refer to it as a war of Gog and Magog. Interesting. Sure. It's going to have a... a, 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 a a sort of a same thing as uh, World War I and World War II, yes. uh, that kind of thing. So, wow, this is so fascinating. Well, let's take, us, let's take us a little further then. So what do you think, Joel, about the recent convergence of most of the pieces of this puzzle in prophecy? Tell us about the, the, what, what we could call the last days or the end of days. What, tell us about what these different pieces are now. That What does it mean? Yeah. Well, one of the reasons that many people think that maybe we're getting close to the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39, or at least to setting the stage for it to happen, one of the reasons that, meant that a growing number of Christians believe that um, is because if you look at a list of some of the prerequisites that the text talks about, we're seeing those things seem to happen. So, for example, you can't have a Russian, Iranian, Turkish alliance to attack a country that doesn't exist, right? So Israel has to be reborn as a country in the last days. Well, that is, that is exactly what's prophesied in the two chapters that precede this, Ezekiel chapters 36 and 37. And those two chapters give enormous amount of specificity and detail of the type of things that will happen when Israel is reborn. Obviously, when we say reborn, it's because Jews were kicked out of the land in 70 AD, right? And so the question is, well, they have to come back, the Jews have to come back by the millions from exile, come back to the Holy Land, rebuild the ancient ruins, make the deserts bloom, establish a sovereign nation state, 
establish, and according to Ezekiel 38, the country is prosperous and, and the Jews feel like they're living securely. It doesn't say that they're, they have full peace with everybody, but they're feeling secure. So for much, from 1948 to just a few years ago, you'd say, well, Jews don't feel secure here. But now we have six Arab-Israeli peace treaties, including mm. the Abraham Accords, right? Israel is the most prosperous nation in the region, even without oil, the most high-tech and the most secure. The Bible speaks of an exceedingly great army in Ezekiel 37. Well, Israel has the strongest military in all of the Middle East. So, and we have an alliance, obviously, with the world's only superpower, the United States, strained though that is as you and I speak. But yeah. when you look at all those things, you say, wow, Russia has an alliance with Iran and Turkey increasingly. I describe that in the book, Enemies and Allies. Israel's reborn and all these things, and you start going, well, maybe God is checking off the list. Right. As, and, and setting the stage or, or arranging the chess pieces on the board for the strike and the attack that's coming. You know, as, as we found in so many of our comments that this episode helped you, our listeners, really grasp the details about Ezekiel 38 and 39 in that prophecy and answered many of your questions about Putin's role and potential place in the prophecy of Gog and Magog. We saw that it really did bless many of you, our listeners, and provided some valuable insights into Bible prophecy. Finally, here it is, the last episode on our list of top episodes for 2022. Earlier in the year, episode 48, titled, Is Russia's Invasion of Ukraine Related to Bible Prophecy? In this episode, Joel shares the surprising results of an exclusive poll commissioned by the Joshua Fund. This episode answered the question, what do Americans believe about Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the COVID pandemic? Are they biblical signs of the last days? This episode also gave hope to those that are looking to the signs to understand Jesus's imminent return. Here's a clip from our number one episode of 2022. I think the number one most stunning uh, takeaway for me from the data is that 103 million Americans believe that the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the COVID pandemic are in fact signs of what Jesus warned of in Bible prophecies that tell us that we're living in the last days. Wow. 103 million Americans. Why do I say that? Well, because we asked this specific question, we'll, we'll share, there's two main ones uh, that we'll talk about today, but the first one was, this, then this is the exact wording, and we'll put it up in the show notes. Uh, uh, in fact, all the data, you can look at all the, what's called the cross tabs, you can see all the, you can go dive deep into the data, and you can say, ah, Carl and Joel are a bunch of, you know, idiots, no. nut jobs, okay, but look at the data. It's we're, we, may, we may be nut jobs, but we're not the only one. <laughs> So here's the first question. Do you agree or disagree? Right. So we're not trying to force anybody. What do you think? Do you agree or disagree that Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has ignited the biggest land war in Europe since World War II, is one of the signs that Jesus spoke of in the Bible when he warned that there would be, quote, wars and rumors of wars in, quote, the last days, unquote, before his return. Hmm. Now, that's a very specific question. Sure. Do you, do, you, do you think that it is a sign of what Jesus spoke of that, that tells us about the last days before he comes back? Or do you think, no, that, I, don't, I don't see that at all? That's, so out of that, well, listen to these numbers. It's crazy. 40% of Americans agree that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is a sign uh, that, uh, that what Jesus said is true and that he, that he's coming back. 40%. Now, 40% of people, now the, the poll was done by, you know, uh, uh, a scientific trusted uh, polling agency. You can, you can see it in the show notes, but it, it, we only polled people 18 and over. So we're not asking five-year-olds 
hey, before you get your mommy and ask her to come to the phone, what do you think? Right. So we're not we're not, you know, jigging the numbers here. The question is. Of 18 and older, what do you think? 40%. 40%. So that when you when you look at the census data and say, well, how many people are there over 18 years old in the United States, right? A country of about 320 million or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what's 40% of that number? It's 103 million. Wow. That is a staggering concept. And and uh, in the days ahead, aside from this podcast, I hope that uh, the Joshua Fund will make sure that this article gets in the hands of the Washington Post and Vanity Fair and the New York Times and the Associated Press and everybody else that's been asking the question to now say, okay, why don't you do a story about this fascinating poll? You might totally think it's hocus pocus, but it's 103 million people who believe this. That's a big deal. That is a huge deal. I mean, to think that uh, 100 million people uh, have made this connection. I mean, I, I think that's that exceeds the number of people who are actually evangelicals in America by our, our best estimates. Um, and that is an incredible reality that this is actually transcending uh, a specific viewpoint of the Bible and of prophecy and of, of various other things. It's actually crossing many other lines uh, out there. That's a great point, Carl. And 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 as as you know, and I want our listeners and viewers to to, to understand, you're right. This was not a survey of born again evangelical Christians alone. It was of all Americans of all races religions and regions. And so, yes, it, it, you know, what we found is 70%, 70, 70, 70% of evangelical Christians in the United States believe this, which is interesting to think, okay, well, 30% either don't think that or they're not sure. Right. We, we reveal that there, there are many people who say they're not sure back to that 40% number. Okay. 40% agree that this is a sign of the last days. But 40% also disagree. Like, so it's split 40-40, and then there's 20% who are like, I don't know. So I'm not surprised by the 40% who's like, no, that's that's crazy. That's not true. And I'm not surprised by a 20% number or a high number or whatever that says, I really don't know. I'm surprised to hear that 40% would say yes when there's no reason to have to say yes. You just say, I don't know, or you're nuts, and they hang up on the call. But if you go deeper, what we find is is this, for example, almost 7% of atheists, self-described hmm. atheists, hmm. agree that the Russian, of invasion, Russian invasion of Ukraine is a sign that Jesus was right of when he described the last days. Now, I'm thinking, did they hear the question? <laughs> How can you be an atheist and think... But it's it's got you no. Know, you could say, well, seven percent is not that much, okay. But seven percent of of an avowed atheist. I don't believe yeah. there's a God. Therefore, I don't believe Jesus is God. Therefore, I don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. Therefore, I don't believe that Jesus is coming back again. Or any Why? supernatural, right? They, yes, I agree. Here's another one: ten percent of agnostics agree. Who, who you don't even you're not even sure that there is a God. Right? How could you believe? But God bless them, right? Here, but here's more. There's a if nineteen percent of people who self-identify as secular, right. they're not saying I, I don't necessarily believe that there's a God, but I just don't I don't practice any type of faith. Okay, mm-hmm. I may believe there's God, but I don't. Twenty almost twenty percent, nineteen percent of secular Americans believe agree that this is a sign of the last days. Now, one more. I mean, we could. It, the numbers are fascinating. We can go into more detail, but I think it's important. Listen to this: twenty-eight percent, twenty-eight percent of Jewish people mm. say. I just want to quote it again. If you're just starting to tune in or something, twenty-eight percent of American Jews say they agree that Russia's invasion of Ukraine is one of the signs that Jesus spoke of in the Bible when he warned that there would be wars and rumors of war in the last days hmm. before the return of Jesus. Hmm. I talked to a Jewish Israeli reporter yesterday uh, who was calling me because of these numbers and was asking me, 
how is it possible that 28% of Jews think this? I said, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I don't, again, I would go back to the question and I said it to her, maybe they didn't hear the question correctly. Right. But you can ask 28% to, you know, to misunderstand what the question is, you know, maybe a few, but 28% are saying maybe that's not even maybe they're wow. saying they agree. They yeah. all don't believe in Jesus. So what's going on? And and I think, Carl, that we don't know the answer, but the number one uh, hypothesis I think we should at least consider is this Russian war is rattling people so much. Hmm. This is so out of the norm, so out of their expectations that they're starting to think this thing feels apocalyptic. It looks like it on television. Hmm. And it may be presaging, foreshadowing something much bigger. Yeah. And for an atheist or an agnostic or a secular person or a Jewish person to say it might have something to do with, with what Jesus said in the Bible about his return, we are entering very interesting and uncharted waters. Well, I know but when I listened to this episode, it was really eye-opening to see and to understand what Americans think about Iran, Russia, COVID, and all of these as they relate to Bible prophecy and about what the Bible teaches. When we think about pestilence, plagues, and global pandemics, we are seeing so many of the signs of Jesus's return. And when wars and rumors of wars are abounding around us, we can draw encouragement from the scripture to know that Jesus is coming back soon. If you missed this episode or any of these episodes, please feel free to go back to our podcast list and check them out. You'll love every moment of the way in which Joel opens up scripture and opens up what God is doing around the world to bless each of our listeners, each one of you with what God is doing. Well, thanks for listening to this episode, a very special episode of the best of 2022. I'm sure you've had a great time going through our list of popular episodes. I sure have. And I hope that you'll find many reasons to encourage others that you know to download this podcast and to uh, access it on whatever format and platform that you get your podcasts. This next year of 2023 will be a pivotal year in God's plan for the nations. And we at the Joshua Fund are praying for you as you pray for those in the midst of the epicenter to stand strong for their faith in 2023. Have you found this episode of our podcast helpful? If you have, we always love it when you get in touch with us. Let us know who you are. Are you someone who's right now at this time of year searching for Jesus? Here's where you can find him. Do you want to talk about something else in the Middle East or any other part of the world as it relates to the epicenter? Please let us know. Do you have a question you want Joel to answer about Bible prophecy or current time events? Go to joshuafund.com and click on contact us. Your feedback is incredibly valuable as we develop this podcast. And as always, you can check out our show notes for anything you heard on the podcast that you'd like more information on. For Joel Rosenberg and the Joshua Fund Ministry Team, I'm Carl Muller. Thanks again for listening to this episode of Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. Hey, I'm Joel Rosenberg. On your left, you'll find some videos we've chosen specifically for you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.